Sometimes I think we can feel and identify a lot with the Israelites in today's first reading, God's people in the Old Testament. And it was quite a scene. As we read in the book of Nehemiah today, all of God's people are gathered in one place, men, women, and children who are old enough to understand. Not unlike us, everyone gathered together in this one place, except they were all weeping. And not like tears of joy, kind of like that child right now, weeping. (laughs) Right? Sadness. But their sadness stemmed from shame. Their sadness stemmed from shame. These people in the first reading, they had just come back from 70 years of being exiled in Babylon. They were taken away from their home. Right, imagine that. Imagine that you were taken away from your home and you could not return and you didn't know when you were going to be able to return. You were removed from your home forcefully and brought to a foreign land and treated at best like a second-class citizen, mostly like a slave, like someone less than human. And then you're brought back. This great surprise. It's a brand new generation that has never visited, never seen Jerusalem, never seen God's promised land. And you would think that they would be overwhelmed with joy. But they were not. They were overcome with shame. So much so that they were on their faces weeping. And the reason was because the prophet Ezra and the prophet Nehemiah standing up and reading to them God's law. And as they listened to God speak to them through those two prophets, they began to realize how far they had strayed from their relationship with God. How much distance had been created between them and their creator, their God who loved them and who brought them back to this land he had promised to their forebears. And they were overcome with shame, weeping. But Nehemiah and Ezra said, Do not be saddened, for rejoicing in the Lord must be your strength. But I do think sometimes we can identify with those people sometimes. Sometimes. That as we gather together, sometimes we're just overcome with shame. And we can look back over these last couple of weeks, and hopefully we do feel some shame. First, we've just witnessed and lived through the longest government shutdown in the history of our nation. We still have not figured out how to live within our means as Americans, and we're the wealthiest nation in the world. And this particular shutdown is over a wall. Some want it, some don't. And border security is a big issue, but at the end of the day, what's really tragic about this whole situation is that we continue as a nation to look at an entire race of people, an entire nationality of people through the categories of security and economics. Not as human beings, many of whom are baptized into Jesus Christ, our very brothers and sisters. But yet we continue to overwhelmingly view them through political, economic, and security categories. And that's tragic. It's shameful. This pastor, a week ago Friday, Another tragic and and pretty shameful event took place in our nation's capital. We, many, many Catholics, tens of thousands, over about 200,000 people throughout our nation gathered in Washington, D.C. for the March for Life. And many of you probably saw it on social media or read about it in the news that a group of students from Covington Catholic High School uh, in Covington, Kentucky, were on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial watching uh, a group of 
protesters and people gathering. And at one point, a Native American man approached them, this group of students, Catholic students, uh, high school students. And all that was posted last Friday on social media was a, a smaller group of high school students with one young man, Nick Sandman, face to face with the Native American gentleman. And it was reputed or reported that this high school student, Nick, had this smirk on his face, kind of like he was mocking this man. And then that this Native American was being provoked by this group of students who were just being goofy. Some were a little out of line, but more or less being goofy high school students as he was kind of pounding on his drum. And so all these people in our nation erupt. Right? Even their own bishop, their own high school, condemned this group of students for this 30-second video. And it wasn't until the weekend was over that we saw the entire video. We saw, in fact, that this high school student, Nick Sandman, was, in fact, the one on the right, the one being virtuous. And the nation continued to mistake virtue for vice. And that's the day we live in where, where virtue is literally mistaken for vice. Because Nick was fulfilling every demand of virtue in that way, especially as our Lord proposed, turning that other cheek, not running away. But he was the one being provoked. And in fact, he turned to one of his classmates and corrected his classmate who was beginning to get out of line. And yet the nation still condemned this young man. It's tragic that we live in a day where virtue is mistaken for vice. Another very tragic event that happened this past Tuesday, the anniversary of Roe versus Wade. In the New York Senate, New York legislators passed what is the most expansive uh, permission for abortion in the United States. In the state of New York, it is now enshrined in law that a person may have an abortion all the way up until the moment of birth. That is now legal in the state of New York. And there was also a video of this law after it was all signed into law in, this, in the State House in New York with many of the legislators and many of the onlookers and visitors there for that historic and momentous occasion were standing in ovation, cheering of this law getting passed. We live in a day where abortion is celebrated and not those who march against it. It's easy to identify with the first, the people of that first reading, right? We can look around us and see just how great that chasm is that exists between our nation, between God's people and God's law between God and his people, and it seems to be growing day by day. And how easy it would be for us to show up here probably every weekend, filled with shame, overcome with shame, and just weeping. But we don't, and we're not allowed to. We're not allowed to because rejoicing in the Lord must be our strength. Rejoicing in the Lord must be our strength. And in fact, more than any preaching, more than any kind of dogma, that is what's going to convert our culture. That is what's going to lessen that chasm, is joy, because it is contagious. And so just as it is our strength, it is also imperative that we invite people into that joy. Because our world, our nation, our community, it needs invited into this joy. And that's where we come in. We who show up here not weeping week in and week out, we who show up here filled with joy, are we asking ourselves this question, who else needs to be here? Who else needs to be here? Who do I know, who do you know that needs this joy? 
in their life that needs to experience this. And not just Mass. Oftentimes it's not where we start with the invitation. I mean, look at our school. If you're running short on things to invite people into, invite them into our school. Right? And let's, let's go down that for a second. Let's go down that path. We look at all the many ways that people give. First, financially. Right? For every quarter that a parishioner gives to our parish in the Sunday collection, or for every dollar, a quarter goes to our school to support the mission of our school. And beyond that, people give to our school very, very generously. We also know that a Catholic school does not run without volunteers, especially those of our parents. A Catholic school does not run without parents giving time, an immense amounts of time, parents and grandparents and parishioners. And third, the sacrifice of our teachers. It's no secret that our teachers take a big financial hit when they come to work for a Catholic school. And that's not just some consequence that they live with, that's something that they willingly choose. They actively choose that because they believe in the mission of our school. They believe in the mission of a Catholic education. And what is the fruit of that? We heard it before Mass today. The fruit of sacrifice is joy. The fruit of sacrifice is new life. The fruit of sacrifice, we can literally hear it, see it, and point to it. And who needs that joy right now? Who needs that kind of joy? Because rejoicing in the Lord is our strength. And if we're going to change God's people, if we're going to change as a nation, we must invite people in to that joy, be it to mass, to school, to any of the numerous fundraisers. I don't care if people give a dime to it. To just be a part of it, to celebrate it, to be a part of the community that is based and founded on Jesus Christ, who is the joy of the world.